more than half to go. Um, if you would this evening, turn with me back to the book of 1 John, this time chapter number 5. We did get to move forward a couple chapters after this morning. 1 John chapter number 5. And I'm going to read verse number 17. It says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Once again this evening we are going to be dealing with the topic of what is sin. Well, in this place the Bible defines sin as all unrighteousness. Folks, as a bit of a review this morning, we looked in first at 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 4, where the Bible says that sin is a transgression of the law. I didn't bring out every point that I had for that, partly because I forgot and partly because I didn't have time to bring out every single point. But this evening I will bring out one more in addition to what I mentioned this morning, and that point is this, sin is being disobedient to God, period. And when we think about the term disobedience, we tend to think about only one side of that. That's one reason I didn't bring it up this morning, because I knew I'd bring up both sides this evening. When we think about disobedience, we tend to think, well, you didn't do what you were told. That's true. There's another side of it, too. We don't think about that other side too much, do we? We always think about it, and partly because when we explain disobedience, that is how we explain it, isn't it? To simply define disobedience, we say, well, you didn't do what we told you to do. Or you didn't do what you were told. Folks, there are two sides to that. You can say, you did what I told you not to do. That's disobedience. You were told not to do something and you did it anyway. That's being disobedient, isn't it? That's where we tend to limit this, isn't it? There's another side of that that makes us a little bit more uncomfortable. You know what that is? There's a side that says, we told you not to do it and you did it. And then there's a side that says, we told you to do something, and you did not do it. Folks, in speaking at my house, that's the side that gets them in trouble more than anything. All right. Let's go ahead and look at it for just a split second. You knew it was coming when I said it. Mark 16, verse number 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You knew it was coming. Hope you buckled up. Do we do that? Oh, yeah, we do that. Do we do that as, as often as we should? Probably not. Therefore, once again, folks, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this because we did it this morning. But as a review, I'm bringing it up again this evening. Therefore, we must conclude we are sinners. Folks, there is a sin of commission and a sin of omission. They're both true. There is a sin where the Lord has said you're not to do it and we do it. And there is also the sin where we're told to do it and we do not. Back to the book of Romans this evening, chapter number 1. I'm not going to read the entire passage that I read this morning. I just want to read one verse over there, and that is verse number 18. The book of Romans, chapter number 1, and verse number 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Folks, I want us to think about that for just a moment. It would appear from this reading, you know, we, we tend to say ungodliness and unrighteousness are two different things, don't we? Or I'm sorry, that they're the same thing, don't we? 
And truthfully, that which is unrighteous is ungodly. We, 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 I would go that far. Paul didn't use them interchangeably here, did he? He used them together. When we say something is godly, what, do, what are we saying? Break the word down. It's like God, right? When we say we are Christians, we are saying we are Christ-like. When we say we are American, unfortunately nowadays we just about have to limit that to where we say we were born in America because we're, as Christians we're not to be like America. But folks, that's what, that's what it is. When we say we are American, we, ha we have co the culture of America, don't we? When we say we are Christian, when we say we are godly, we are to reflect God. And certainly, as I said a moment ago, unrighteousness does not reflect God because we have a righteous God. So automatically, I will submit to you, any, un, any and all unrighteousness is sin, period. Let's take it a step farther, though. Anything, <clears throat> folks, this is where, the, as I said this morning, this is where the rubber's going to meet the road. Anything that negatively reflects our God is ungodliness and is sin. Boy, I, I got quiet in here on that one. If we give the world opportunity to blaspheme God by what we are doing, it is sin. And folks, I'm going to just go ahead and say it this way. There has been a lot of discussion this past week on things of this nature. <clears throat> things... And I'm trying to word this the best way I can in my memory. The best way I can say it, things we would be allowed to do but maybe should not do. Does that make sense in your mind? Things that for me may not be a sin. But if you saw me doing them, they may cause you to sin. I'll, it's called a stumbling block. That's, what, that's the word the Bible uses. Folks, did you realize it is a sin to be a stumbling block? <clears throat> it is. I'll read some verses on it later. Lord willing. It is a sin for us to live in an ungodly manner. It is a sin for us to live in an unrighteous manner. God will hold us accountable for it. Hey, the verse I was going to read later came up quick. Romans chapter 14, verse number 23. You ready? Romans 14, 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever. I'm sorry, I, I have uh, left out the middle part of that verse. I looked up at the wrong time. It says, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he is not in faith. I didn't think it sounded right, right when I read it the first time. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Oh boy. I will be the first to admit when I got to this portion of reading Brother Stepp's sermon and when I began to think about this, I had to read it. 
stop, back up, read it again. Because when you think about this, how often do we fall into this, folks? How often do we live without faith? How often do we do things without faith? You heard me say a minute ago the words take it for granted. How often? Folks, let, let me ask you this one. This is, we, this is something we all can relate to, I think. How many of you, when you go into the kitchen or other rooms in your house that may have a sink, and you reach out and you grab that handle and you give it a twist or a turn or a pull, whatever you do, do you say, I sure hope the Lord allows water to come through here, or I have faith the Lord is going to supply me water, or do you just automatically, uh, blankly not even think about it and just pull the handle and say there's going to be water come out of this? We take it for granted, don't we? And I know that sounds like a very simple, very elementary example. But as we'll read here, just a few more verses down in my notes, the Bible calls the plowing of the wicked sin. <clears throat> Catch that? I want us to really think about this one. Those of us that farm, those of us that plow, do we plow in faith? Or take for granted when we plow that ground up and put the seeds in it, they're going to come up. You better not do the second one. Folks, if we're not living by faith, we are sinning. This world, folks, I, the world we live in, it's all about what can be seen, what can be heard, what can be felt, what can be observed, what can be measured, what can be studied, what can be handled, what can be scientifically tested. There's no faith in any of that. You know that? The Bible defines faith as the evidence. Or let me see. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. We've not seen Christ in person, have we? Yet we believe. We've not seen heaven, have we? Yet we believe. Folks, I... I'm going to say some things this evening, and it may sound ridiculous, but I want you to understand with me, it is not ridiculous. <clears throat> the Bible just said, whatever is not a faith is sin, right? And you can accuse me of taking it too far if you want to. When we go to the grocery shopping, do we pray for a parking spot that's up close to the store or do we just say well when I get there I'm going to take whatever's available folks you may say well praying for a parking spot that's just ridiculous it shows faith if we pray believing the Lord can provide it you ever pray that when you get up in the morning pray your car will start and I don't mean just because it's out of gas Brother Butch and I both experienced that one today. Do you pray for the Lord's safety when you get up? And I'm not talking about a trip across the country. What about one across town? Oh, I'm only going a mile. A lot can happen in a mile. Folks, that which is not of faith is sin. And folks, I'm going to say this again. And I'm thankful for this, by the way. <coughs> God is not like our dining room chairs. And if you all have metal, metal dining room chairs, good for you. Wood ones will sometimes fail you. 
Metal ones will eventually, but wood does. It seems like it's more often. We have faith when we pull that chair out and we sit down and it's going to hold us up, don't we? What happens when that support between the legs comes out? <laughs> you can become, uh, the way I say it is you become reacquainted with the floor very quickly, don't you? Was that a lack of faith in the chair? No, we had faith in the chair. It was a lack of ability of the chair. Our God does not have a lack of ability, folks. Our God is omnipotent or all-powerful. Our God performs his will. If you remember a few weeks ago, it was several weeks ago now, I preached a sermon on the ambiguous God of today's Christianity. And as part of that sermon, there was a sentence that I used. It said, when God thinks that it is as good as done. Because there's nothing too great for our God. We should have faith in our great God. Folks, as a matter of fact, if you go, I, I quoted Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 1. Let's go read verse number 6. Hebrews chapter number 11. Verse number 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Folks, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Book of Romans, chapter number 8. I'll get to Romans, chapter number 8 here in just a minute. Verse number five, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Folks, you notice there are two different categories here. When we are born again, or uh, born uh, uh, but after the spirit, folks, we're born again, we're to follow the Holy Spirit. Folks, there is... There is no excuse, I'm going to say it that way, for us to be born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and continue to walk after the flesh. There's no excuse there. Are we all guilty of it from time to time? Yep. Do we have an excuse? No. It says in verse number 6, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal or fleshly mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Folks, we read over there in Hebrews chapter number 11 verse number 6 Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And now we've read in Romans 8, 8, for they, I'm sorry, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Folks, if you remember, the Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter number 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. For by grace are you saved through faith. And then the Bible continues, and that, and that, the word that there points back to the word faith. That faith, not of yourself. That faith is a gift of God. 
So, folks, you see, those that are in the flesh have no faith. Yeah, they may have faith in the, the same example I gave in the chair or in their car, but they have no faith in God. And, folks, that's the faith that it's talking about here is the faith in God. So once again, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That which is not of faith is sin. <clears throat> Folks, here's another one. And this is one of those that make me go, ouch. Every time I do it. What is our motivation? You remember this morning we read over in the book of Mark, the first commandment is to love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Our motivation for our service to God ought to be that love. If it's our pride, we're sinning. If it's so that we can be seen, we're in sin. It's to please God. That should be our motivation. Go with me now to the verse I mentioned a minute ago over in Proverbs chapter number 21. Proverbs chapter number 21, beginning in verse number 2, it says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Folks, this begins to bring up what I was talking about earlier. We can justify, and we can use Bible to justify anything we want to justify. Even if it's not something that is directly found in Scripture, we can take something else and twist it around and make it mean something else to give us permission to do what we want to do. An example of that is, if you remember back in the Old Testament, we find that David... Love Jonathan, and his, their souls were knit together. You know what? The homosexual says that's the first account of homosexuals. Well, if you study that, that's not what it means, is it? Not at all. Matter of fact, if you read the, in Romans 1, the verses I read this morning, the Bible calls that that which is against nature. There. God destroyed, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for that. I can give other examples. Um, and, and, but they all come down to the same thing. They all come down to either verses being taken out of their context and twisted to mean what, the, to what you want it to mean or verses just entirely being misused. The Word of God does not justify sin. Nowhere in the word of God are you going to find something that says because this person did this or that person did that, you have permission to do it. What you'll find is because this person did I'll, I'll go to David because David committed a, adultery and murder with, in regards to Bathsheba and Uriah the baby that was conceived at the time of that relation died. Correct? And if you study it out, you'll find the words written, The sword shall never depart from thy house. I cannot remember right off the top of my head if it's recorded that he lost three or four sons. I can't, I can't remember right off. But it was one of the two.
If you're in Proverbs uh, 21 still, which I hope you are, look at verse number 3. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. I have to pause here again. I'll eventually get down to the verse I came here to read. Folks, do you think God desired in the Old Testament, do you think God desired the obedience or the sacrifices? Which one do you think he, deserve, he desires today, obedience or repentance? I know that that is a loaded question because the answer is both. It's not a trick question, though. I promise it's not a trick question. And the answer is very simple. God would desire the obedience. Folks, think about it this way. If a child is disobedient to you as a parent or a grandparent, do you take pleasure in the apology? No. You would take pleasure in the obedience, wouldn't you? Folks, our God is the same way. Yes, the, the sacrifices that were offered, the Bible teaches, were a sweet-smelling sweet savor. But folks, if you go back and you study, the reason behind the sacrifices was sin. Right? Obedience is what the Lord desires. Folks, that's what the, right now, today, in 2023, just about... Just a few hours from 2024, the Lord desires obedience. What is sin? The question of this, uh, the, the topic that we're looking at. What is sin? It is disobedience. It is the opposite of what God desires. Now, look at verse number four, now that we're finally there. A high look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Just think about that for just a minute. And, and think about it through this thought. What man often deems as right, God views as wrong. Do you realize that? If you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter number 6 and verse number 5, you'll find the words written, if I can get it to come all the way through in my mind. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every thought of the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. That's the state of man, folks. How can we, who are accustomed to do evil, Judge what is right and wrong. We have a knowledge, of course, of what is right and wrong. But folks, how, how can we dare to stand before God and say, I don't see anything wrong with what I'm doing? Times have changed. Well, yes, I would agree, times have changed. God has not. Times have changed because man has strayed further and further and farther from what God has put forth. Right? Times have changed for the worst. Times have not gotten more and more godly. We're not getting... <coughs> excuse me. We're not getting, as a society, more and more like God. We're getting more and more like the devil. Well, that tells us right off the bat we're moving the wrong direction, doesn't it? Times have certainly changed, but God has not. What man proclaims as righteousness is often unrighteousness. <clears throat> Sin... Folks, sin takes our best efforts and destroys them. 
Sin takes our best intentions. That's the word I was looking for. And turns them into something that's completely unrecognizable. Because even for the child of God, our nature is to sin. This fleshly nature is to sin. What is sin? It is our nature. A couple more verses on this thought, and then you, I hope, I'm going to make time to do it. I'm going to put it that way. I'm not going to say I hope. I'm not going to say maybe. I'm going to say I'm going to make time. We're going to look at something else right at the end. One more thing as to what is sin. Now I can quote this verse. <clears throat> it's a verse that's stuck in my mind right well. That's in James chapter number 4 and verse number 17. You know what the Bible says there? Therefore, to him that do, knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What is sin? It's to know to do good and not do it. It's another layer of disobedience, isn't it? <clears throat> I know the Lord would have me to do this, but I'm just too busy. I know the Lord would have me to go there, but I just can't. You know what else that is? That is a willful disobedience and a deliberate disobedience. That's dangerous, folks. First Corinthians chapter number 8, and originally I was going to read the whole chapter, but I'm not going to this evening. I would ask that you all take time to do that on your own leisure. Um, I want to begin reading in verse number 8, and it's not the smoothest place to begin, but that's where we're going to begin. It says in 1 Corinthians 8, 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. <clears throat> it says in verse number 9, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Ah. For if any man see thee which uh, hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak, weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Folks, I told you a few minutes ago being a stumbling block is a sin. Right there it is, isn't it? I've used this for an example every time this topic has come up, and I'll use it again tonight. I don't even know if Olive Garden still does this, just so you all know. But it used to be if you went in there, from time to time, the waiter was carrying around a couple wine glasses and a bottle of wine. And when he sat you down and took your order, he'd say, would you like to sample some wine with your dinner? Well, folks, if you all have ever seen anybody that did that, they barely put more in the glass than what we get when we observe the Lord's Supper. It's about, looked like about that much in the bottom of the cup. Not enough to get you drunk, not enough to affect you in any way. I could easily sit back and say, well, I have liberty to do that, right? I could say it. There's two things I want to point out. First off, and I know that this document over here to my right, your all's left, is based in Scripture, but it is the, word, it is the words of man. But you know what that verse says? It says, we covenant, folks, that's the church covenant. We agree, we, we covenant, promise, 
to abstain from the sale of and the use of intoxicating drink as a beverage. <clears throat> well, that kind of takes that liberty away a little bit, doesn't it? That's like... Like I said, that's not the word of God. That's the word of man. I want to get back to the word of God because you know what? That's where that's what counts. What does it say here? What did it say in verse number nine? <clears throat> but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. What would happen? Just just throwing this out there. What would happen? If halfway through my meal, one of the church members came out, and came in and saw me with a glass of wine on the table, would they know how much started was there to start with? Would they know how many glasses came before it? And I know somebody back there is probably sitting there thinking, "Well, that's between you and your God." Folks, I want you to know that's a pretty arrogant stance to take, isn't it? God knows the truth. Well, sure he does. But also, <clears throat> let's take it another step, folks. What if somebody that knows me from seeing me on Facebook or YouTube or Sermon Audio were to sit there and say, man, that's the pastor of Beauty Mountain Baptist Church. I've heard him get up and preach against alcohol. And here he is drinking it. Uh-oh. All of a sudden, they're looking at me like I'm a hypocrite, aren't they? Hey, I got news for you. They're probably right. But, folks, what I'm driving at here is this. Yes, I may, have, I may be able to use the argument, I have liberty to do that. But does that make it right? You see the difference? <clears throat> we cannot use, and the, the, the next verse that I have is actually in Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 13 where the Bible says, and I can just about quote that one, but I'm not going to try it because I want us all to see what it says. Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 13. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. We can't use our liberty as an occasion to sin, can we? We are free, but we're not free to sin, you see. As we go through the rest of this study, I hope that we can sit back and see that that's exactly what, I'm try what this study is trying to bring out is sin is dangerous. And there may be things that we would not necessarily count as being exceeding sinful today. But how, what does God see it as? You see. <clears throat> Folks, any righteousness that we have is the imputed righteousness of Christ. And folks, you may be sitting back there this evening and you may be thinking, and believe me, as I was sitting there reading through this book, the first, this, this, was, this sermon was the introduction to Brother Stepp's book. Part of it, most of it was not most of it was mine but I did like when I when I referenced his book I, I, I made sure I made mention of that but folks let me tell you something you may be sitting back there saying well it looks like everything we do is sin we've said sin is a transgression of the law we've said sin is disobedience to God sin is denying the existence or the authority of God. Sin is when we know to do good and don't do, don't do it. Sin is when all unrighteousness and all ungodliness. Seems like all we do is sin. <clears throat> well, guess what, folks? If that's what you're thinking, you're not that far off. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I'm thankful for that verse. Where sin abounds, folks, not where sin abounded. 
I'm, I'm saying it for, for present tense now. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But folks, if you're here and you're lost, sin abounds. Right? The second half of the verse isn't there yet if you're lost. Now, yes, I'll have to say there's grace that the Lord has allowed you to live, that there's grace that the Lord, you know, the Lord sends rain on the just and the unjust. There's things like that we can apply. But if you were to die in your sin, you're going to hell. And then you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. I want to read what Brother Stepp put at this point in his sermon. And somehow or another, I've managed to actually keep the book's pages turning as I've been going through them. I don't usually do that. Usually I'm like, hang on a minute, let me find where I want to read. But I managed to keep up with myself this evening. He says here, and this is uh, the last, next to last paragraph on page 16. He says, and then again. Even if there were a balance of good works, it might somehow weigh in, in your or my favor. Who will atone for those evil and wicked works? They're still there, aren't they? Folks, do you remember? I, I know you do. Do you remember why the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world? To bear the sins of his people, right? Right? He was the atonement for our sin. Folks, if by some miracle we could take a balance out, and that's how I said it this morning too, if we could take a balance out, and you all have seen those things that I'm talking about. They've got like a cup on this side and a cup on this side, and they're balanced in the middle. If we could take that out and set it up on this desk, and I could take our bad works and I could put them on one side and our good works and put them on the other side, and as Brother Step here says, might somehow weigh in our favor, meaning our good works could somehow outweigh our bad works. Does that mean our bad works are all of a sudden gone? Uh-oh. There's a problem, isn't there? There's the problem. It's not how good or bad. It's not how righteous or how sinful you may be in your lifetime that makes the difference. The fact that a person goes to hell means that they are a sinner. Means they were dead in trespasses and sins, right? It's being a good person will not save you. Doing good works will not save you. Being a member of the church will not save you. Being baptized will not save you. Because you know what? No matter what righteousness you may do, if, you're, if you die and your sins are not paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are responsible for them. It's not about how good or bad we were. It's not at all. Folks, I read down at Indoor Wednesday night, or Thursday night, sorry. I get my nights mixed up. And it says in John chapter number 3, verse number 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why did God not send Christ into the world to condemn the world? The answer is because the world was condemned already. He that believeth on... Ah, boy, lost it. John 3, 18 is where I'm headed. You all can catch up. John chapter 3, verse number 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. That's it, isn't it? He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Folks, when you are born, you are condemned. That's what that's saying, isn't it? By nature, we are condemned. To continue with what Brother Step was saying here, 
Are you able to atone for sin? No. Has any man that has ever lived been able to atone for his own sins? Nope. Aside from Christ, understand with me this evening. Has any man that's ever lived ever been able to, to, to atone for someone else's? I know Christ did, but like I say, I, him excluded. I cannot die for your sins. If I die, it would be for my own sins, wouldn't it? Christ had no sin. Christ hath once suffered the just for the unjust. Folks, without the finished work of Jesus Christ, those that are lost are without hope. I hope and I pray that if you're lost here this afternoon, you will consider that condition. You will consider everything that I have said here today. Folks, I cannot save you. You cannot save you. Can't be done. Sin is powerful, folks. Sin is very powerful. If you are not trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, as I just read in John chapter 3 and verse number 18, then you are currently under condemnation. If you die in that position, you are bound for hell. I pray if you are lost here this evening that the Lord would work a work of grace in your heart. I pray the Lord would reveal himself unto you. I pray the Lord would give you faith and grace. I was really going to fix that no pins at home situation. I had three of them in my Bible. I'll stop there for this evening. If all hearts...